Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining in from. I'm Sujeev Shakya, your host today. I would like to welcome everyone, including audiences watching on World Bank Live, Facebook, X, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We are here as the South Asia Development Update is being launched. The South Asia Development Update is the World Bank's flagship semi-annual report for South Asia, analyzing topical economic policy challenges and assessing growth prospects for the region and individual countries. South Asia is expected to, be, to continue to be the fastest growing emerging market and developing economy region over the next two years. The growth pickup in the near term is reliant on the public sector, whereas private investment in particular continues to be weak. Employment growth is falling short of working age population growth. The region fails to fully capitalize on its demographic dividend. Vibrant competitive firms are key to unlocking the demographic dividend, robust private investment, and workers' ability to move out of agriculture. A range of policies could spur firm growth, including improved business climates and institutions, the removal of financial sector restrictions, and greater openness to trade and capital flows. Today, the panelists will not be answering questions, but there will be people responding on the chat. Do interact through the hashtag South Asia Development and to pose questions online through the World Bank Live chat window. So today's format in the next one hour, we have a, a fireside chat, uh, Ahmed and Saeed, CEO of Allied Climate Partners and Martin Reiser, World Bank Vice President for South Asia would be on conversation. And then there will be a panel discussion I'll be moderating with Subrakant Panda, Managing Director at IMFA, Dur A. Nayab, Joint Director, Pro Vice Chancellor of Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, and Francisca Onsorj, World Bank Chief Economist for South Asia. So now let's kickstart the fireside chat without much ado by inviting Martin Reiser, World Bank Vice President for South Asia, and Ahmed Al Saeed, CEO of Allied Climate Partners. There is this fireside chat would be for 18 minutes, and I'll get back with the panel. Over to you, Martin and Ahmed. Thank you, uh, thank you, Sujeev. It's good to see you, and it's particularly good to see you, uh, Ahmed. We worked together some time ago uh, in East Asia, uh, and uh, it's great to uh, to be back in touch with you through this uh, virtual means of communication. Apologies to all of our uh, viewers and hearers about my croaky voice. It's that time of year, I guess. Um, it's not just the early morning hour in Washington. But I'm very pleased to, to talk with Ahmed uh, about uh, South Asia's um, economic prospects. Um, let me just put a little bit of context behind this conversation. So uh, South Asia is the world's fastest growing region. Uh, the World Bank divides us uh, regions into seven, and South Asia now holds the top spot, um, uh, and with about six percent uh, growth uh, foreseen this year and 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 next. Um, that's a very respectable growth rate, but it's largely driven by the very strong and robust growth in India. Uh, in other parts of the region, things are not going quite as well, and even when you look at India, you see that a big part of the boost to growth has come from strong public investment. Uh, there's some signs perhaps that uh, now finally the private sector is starting to pick up that there's some handover. But I'd like to ask you that question, Ahmed. Um, from your experience, you've worked in the private sector, you worked in the public sector, you worked for an international uh, development institution, the ADB, uh, and you're now um, with uh, uh, climate, climate uh, allied partners. What is it that South Asia needs to do to build a robust private sector-led foundation for its economic growth so that we can talk about South Asia being the fastest growing region, not just uh, for this year and perhaps next, but for the decade to come. So uh, good morning to you, Martin. I know you're in Washington and, and good day to everyone else, wherever they may be. Uh, thank you for having me here. I have to say, Martin, uh, when our paths crossed uh, in our work in East Asia, uh, I always uh, I always looked forward to hearing you answer questions, 
Uh, and so it's, it's a bit to my chagrin uh, that the order is reversed here, uh, particularly on a subject when there are so many online, I think, who know so much more than me. Uh, but I'll have to wait, uh, or perhaps towards the end of this, I can get the opportunity to ask you a question or two. And let me, let me try to just open up uh, what I hope is an is a enlightening and useful conversation. You know, I, I often think people say, uh, you know, how do we unlock private sector-led growth? And the phrase has always given me pause uh, because, in fact, I really do think it's a bit of a misnomer. I, I had the privilege um, years ago in my career at working at the U.S. Treasury and a former U.S. Treasury Secretary who had also been uh, the chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs used to say, capital is a coward. Um, and, and the point that Robert Rubin was making was that capital flows towards safety and away from uh, unpredictability and uncertainty. And so I think in the first instance, uh, to unlock the engine of private capital growth in South Asia, we continue to need to, need to make investments in, in the role of the public sector and in creating what we often call an enabling environment. You know, in terms of what the MDBs can do, I often think about this question of how do we get more private capital into developing countries? Uh, in really simple, quite simple terms that I find quite useful. And, and I, I tend to divide it into three buckets. And bucket one is just improve the country, raise the ceiling of possibility. Um, this obviously has been the work of the World Bank in close concert with governments across South Asia for many years, um, beginning with work on economic policy, domestic resource mobilization, improving the education sector, or labor market uh, rigidities, and so forth and so on. Um, the second category, I'll describe these categories and I'll describe something new or different, I think, that's emerging in each uh, after describing them. The second is really kind of at the level of the project. How do we improve economics? How do we strip off types of risk? Um, again, the World Bank Group is quite active. How do we, because we know that investors are quite concerned about political risk, okay, let's provide a form of insurance to strip that off. So first issue, of course, is the country, but the second really is the project level economics. Blended finance has a role to play here in terms of lowering the cost of capital. And then the third bucket, which I think really often gets ignored in all of this, is when there's a gap between the ceiling of possibility defined by the public sector environment and what we've been able to do through private action, how do we actually bridge that gap? And often I find that public sector institutions um, and speaking myself as, as a veteran of one, the ADB, which is, a, as you know, a sister organization to the World Bank, we often assume, well, if there's opportunity, the private sector surely will have stepped in. But the reality is that there are all sorts of rigidities and, and misunderstandings or, or lack of understanding between the public sector and the private sector. And in fact, public sector institutions have a role in addressing things that fall sometimes well short of market failure. They may just be market inertia. In each of these, I'd say it's, the World Bank Group has been active for many years, but I'll maybe just offer some suggestions about new opportunities under these three categories. In terms of policy advice, uh, I think we're in an interesting era where many countries are returning, if not to full-blown industrial policy, to a greater recognition that the interplay between the role of the state and the role of the private sector is more dynamic and fungible and porous than we had assumed for a few decades at least. I think that's a really important place for the World Bank Group to step in and help governments identify what are best practices in terms of thinking about that intersection. Um, the second thing I'd say is that climate change changes everything. Um, we, you know, typically we assume we don't know too much about the future. Actually, we know a lot about the future. We know a lot about how it's gonna affect, you know, certain communities, how it's going to even affect the nature of opportunity, um, where technology spend will go globally. And I think helping countries think through proactively how they pre-position themselves for a world we know is coming is slightly different from the kind of work that the public sector institutions have been doing. And actually, in many cases, demands a reinvestigation from first principles of certain core tenets of approach. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, in terms of what to do around managing different kinds of risks, I've had the opportunity to participate in uh, President Ajay Banga's private sector lab. There's some really interesting things going on there. For example, how do you take tools that apply to the project level and apply them at the portfolio level? Could you do PRI at a portfolio level? I think there's a lot that can go on there. 
And then in the last category, you know, one thing that's always amazed me um, is how little, as, as someone who's had the opportunity to move between public and private sector, how little they understand each other. Um, I, there's a blog post, there's a podcast done recently by a, a very senior private sector MDB official um, who left and went to work for a very large global bank. And this global bank, I would say, is probably the most public sector leaning of the large global universal banks. And in this podcast, the person was asked what surprised you. Um, and what she said was, what surprised me was how little they understood us being meaning her prior organization and how little we understood them. And, and this was probably someone who was the most private sector leading senior role in the MDB system, going to the place that was the most MDB leaning of the private sector institutions. And so that gap remains very large. And I think there's a lot that we can do to try to address it. Maybe I'll just pause there, uh, Martin. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Ahmed. Lots of, uh, lots of issues which we won't have time in 18 minutes to all cover, but let me pick up, uh, let me pick up uh, maybe one of them. You mentioned climate change is everything. Uh, so South Asia is one of the regions most vulnerable, most exposed to climate change. Um, I think uh, by some estimate, 60 million people get affected in one way or another by a climate disaster um, uh, uh, over, the, over the, I think over the past decade, that's the uh, estimate in the report. Um, and uh, so we did in the report some analysis to understand how do firms, how do farmers, and how do households adapt to the impact of climate change. And it's quite interesting to find that firms are actually reasonably good at adapting. Uh, mm. When a shock comes, they recover, um, I think, up to uh, 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 around 70% uh, of the losses uh, that uh, the climate shock um, imparted on them, but households and farmers are less able to adapt. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that a lot of uh, the households are still working in the rural economy. And of course, agriculture uh, has inherently uh, um, uh, greater difficulty of adapting uh, to changing weather patterns. That's, uh, that's historically been true. And for agriculture, which in South Asia remains in many cases low productivity, uh, that's um, uh, that's uh, a fortiori uh, true. So when you look at the climate challenge for South Asia, with climate changing everything, um, how do you think policymakers should prepare for uh, the the uh, the likely impact of climate change? Actually, one more thing that the report also does point out is that one of the most effective climate adaptation. Uh, uh, strategies is development uh, in the sense that public goods, uh, better infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, better build cities, better transport, um, uh, just access to basic amenities is one of uh, the complementary uh, means by which both uh, firms and households and farmers adapt. Uh, but, but when you look at the vulnerability and the fact that particularly the most vulnerable parts of society have a harder time adapting, um, uh, what do you think governments should do to prepare themselves for this, uh, for the likely, uh, you know, uh, multiplication of negative climate events going forward? Yeah, as you know, Martin, that's a huge, that, that, as you say, there's so many uh, things that one can't fully uh, delve into in, in a limited period of time. I think there's so much embedded in that question. Um, uh, you close by asking what can governments do? And I think uh, we're here just at the tail end, just a few days after the Easter weekend. And so I will borrow a phrase uh, and say that the first thing we, we governments need to do, uh, and, and just extending my earlier comments on, on the relationship between public and private sector is, you know, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to Adam Smith uh, what is Adam Smith's. Uh, and so I think in the first instance, when it comes to adaptation, uh, which you referred to, we have to recognize that these are that a significant portion and a larger portion than investment that will go into resilience is fundamentally a public good. Uh, and so the role of the state in um, both in building its capability to deliver, 
whether that's mobilizing resources or it's institution, institutional capacity to oversee, um, there is simply no replacement for state capacity when it comes to addressing uh, the challenge of climate change, especially in a region which is so incredibly vulnerable, especially in a region which is so incredibly vulnerable, um, where institutional capacity is limited in many cases to large firms and the governments themselves. Um, having said that, I'll make another general comment, I think, about climate change. And we often um, hear of a of sort of a zero sum narrative between developed and developing world around climate change. And that's entirely understandable in certain cases, even though the cost of renewable technologies has come down, they're not always, for example, baseload technologies. And so there's a natural uh, hesitancy, I think, uh, on the part of those whose populations still fall well below the global poverty lines to say, you know, let me fix this first, let me address poverty first, and then I'll get to that. And I think that that narrative, um, it's really important that we all invest in countering that narrative because I think it gets several things wrong. Um, the first thing, of course, it gets wrong is that the greatest suffering will be in the very places that are the most vulnerable and in many cases, the most destitute today. And so the greatest responsibility or the greatest um, self-interested need for action, for better or for worse, is in those places. But that's really on the risk side. On the opportunity side, I think we haven't yet fully realized the development opportunity that decarbonization represents for the planet. And I think if we, if at the highest level, um, for the first time in the history of this project of, of economic development, this noble work that I think everybody uh, who's, who's here is interested in or working on. For the first time ever, the actual fate of all future generations are totally intertwined. Um, the, the person, the multi-billionaire financier on the Upper East Side of New York City's grandchildren, that individual knows that that his or her grandchildren's fate is entirely dependent on the decarbonization trajectory of India or Pakistan or Indonesia. That's never been the case before. Yes, of course, everybody had an interest in the growth of the global economy. There were spillover benefits for everyone. But that deep level of intertwining of common fate actually, I think, starts to unlock possibility at a scale that hasn't existed before. And actually, we see that. If you look at and, and all of these initiatives, they're complex and they're large and they're early days and so they're much criticized, but I think it's important to note what's unique about them. The JETP process, the Just Energy Transition Partnerships. If you look at the banks who are involved um, and the level of interest, it's at the CEO level of the most significant, systemically significant global financial institutions in the world. Those CEOs, emerging markets were number 50 on their priority list if it wasn't for decarbon, the need to address climate change. And so suddenly we have an opportunity for developing countries to access resources and expertise at a level that wasn't there before. That's one aspect of it. And then the other thing I'd say is that we also now know a bit of what the future looks like. And it is possible for countries to think about how they preposition themselves around this decarbonization, decarbonized economy of the future. How do you train your people? What sort of skills do you want? How do you think about your natural resources and the value added capabilities that may be around them? How do you ensure that your border adjustments? I think all of that represents enormous opportunity. Um, and it's always easier to drive growth with the wind at your back um, than it is to fight uh, the forces of change. And so, I think that all of those things mean that climate change, which represents both an existential threat, at the same time represents an unprecedented opportunity. Um, and therein lies, I think, much of the opportunity uh, as well as the risk uh, for the region and for other parts of the world. Thanks, uh, Ahmed. I, I think Sajib is going to remind us soon that our time is up, but I did want to uh, uh, come back one, one, uh, one further time. Um, I mean, you mentioned uh, industrial policy in your first intervention, and now you mentioned the opportunities of decarbonization. Um, and, and of course, it does 
uh, turn out that at least one of the countries in our region, uh, India, is looking at that very actively, uh, employing industrial policy to bring uh, green technologies to India, uh, not just for its own decarbonization needs, but essentially, uh, you know, as a means of attracting investment and creating jobs. Uh, now, this is one of the weaker aspects of South Asia's uh, economic um, development in the in, in recent decades. Growth has been quite strong, but job creation has fallen behind the rate of uh, increase in the working age uh, population. So only, only about two thirds of the new entrants into the labor force uh, have actually been successfully integrated uh, on average in South Asia. And employment rates uh, in the region um, have been uh, falling, um, uh, including for men. It's not just that female uh, labor force participation is is low. It's it's also that uh, male labor force participation has been uh, has been falling in South Asia. Um, when you look at that picture, um, a lot of it, I think, has to do with what we talked at the beginning: uh, the difficulty of creating sustainable private sector investment. Uh, does climate change that calculation as well? Do you see uh, a future of job creation and green jobs? Or what, is, it, is it manufacturing that's going to bring the future of job creation to South Asia? How can uh, South Asia deal with uh, the issue that employment uh, has been, has been uh, lagging overall? You know, Martin, I said at the outset that I, I, I would prefer to ask you questions rather than to answer your questions. So <laughs> I'll take my stab, but I, I would love to hear your views. Um, I think that uh, green industrialization, for lack of a better phrase, uh, is part of the story, but it's not the entire story. Um, and your team at the World Bank and others, you know, have been, you know, even in this report that's being released today, you know, point to a number of inefficiencies in labor markets, uh, in lack of infrastructure spend, in, in limited capability of the states. So there's there's a lot. I thought maybe just I'll single out two things that I see in the region that I haven't read as much about, and I'd be curious uh, if the World Bank has done work on them. I think they could be potentially interesting because they represent opportunities to to drive change a bit below the level of truly structural engagement. The first relates to the quality of financial intermediation. Um, and, you know, in an economy with large sort of state dominated banks, oligopolistic commercial structures, one of the things that happens is that capital really doesn't get allocated as efficiently. And, and I think one opportunity, it seems to me, I would, I would postulate, to drive incremental change is really to invest in improving the quality of financial intermediation and the and the establishment of new high quality financial intermediaries. Something actually the IFC has a history of doing in India quite successfully many years ago. That would be sort of one comment that would be interesting for my side to explore further. The other would be, you know, the region has very small firms. They tend to be relatively less productive or uh, relatively less job creating than small firms in other regions. And I found, at least in my work at the ADB, that the category of small firms was misleading. That, in fact, the subset we were looking for was a category of high growth firms, all of which started small. Um, and so it'd be interesting to see if there's more could, that could be done uh, to disaggregate those and, and make sure that the financial resources that were the hose of capital we direct at the small firm ecosystem, how do we get it to flow more precisely to the subset uh, that actually can drive growth in the future? Thanks a lot. Actually, that's a really good point um, uh, that, that in South Asia, a lot of the job creation takes place in large firms or in very small firms, but much less job creation takes place in firms that start small and grow large over time. And so I think that's uh, that's clearly one part of the the diagnostic, and I very much agree with you that while green uh, technologies provide part of the answer, they're only part of the answer, and it's a broader problem. Uh, but there's also a big opportunity in the services sector. One of the things that we find is that, in part because uh, South Asia has a comparative advantage in services and has been able to use it so effectively, uh, it has the possibility, uh, even that current technologies, to follow a decarbonization or a, a, a growth path that is less carbon intensive. Uh, 
uh, than uh, the uh, heavy industrialization based uh, growth path of East Asia, for example. We have to leave it here, but uh, it's fascinating uh, to talk to you, Ahmed, and uh, I hope we get a uh, we get a chance to to continue this conversation. With that, thank you very much uh, all for listening. I look forward to hearing the panel elaborating further on this point. Back to you, Sajeev. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, uh, for summarizing it. And thank you, Ahmed. I think uh, it sets the context and we are talking about uh, we are talking about uh, three things I could just take away from the conversation, which sets the context for our panel is to look at the bridge between public sector thinking and private sector action that is taking place. And we and and as Ahmed mentioned, as the climate change changes the future. And so how do you think proactively adaptability of the firms uh, and how household farmers, rural economies need to transition and how investments into resilience is a public good. That's uh, And I, I love what he talked about was on how fate of everyone is going to be intertwined. And that's, that's, that's a fascinating way to start this conversation. So we have with us three panelists. Uh, Dur E. Nayab is the Joint Director and Research uh, Director of Research at the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics. We have Francisca Onsolj, uh, is the World Bank Chief Economist for South Asia, and Subrakant Pande, uh, Panda sorry, uh, from India, uh, Managing Director of uh, Indian Metal and Ferro Alloys Limited, also the former uh, president of uh, the Indian Private Sector Body, uh, Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industries. So over the next 40 minutes, we'll try to cover three major pillars. Uh, growth prospects, jobless development, uh, and uh, and and uh, job-oriented development, and then to look at uh, uh, climate adaptation. So I would start with Francisca, and I think in this report uh, it, it points out that South Asia continues to grow, as we were discussing, and Martin was also mentioned. Also, the report does highlight some large differences across, you know different uh, across countries like India and in the earlier fireside chat also came in and the rest of the region. So do, could you elaborate a bit on that? And I think we can do you know rounds of three minutes each so that we can have more conversation. Over to you, Francisca. Thank you, Sajeev. Thank you. Yeah, the region is, South Asia is the fastest growing emerging market and developing economy region. We expect growth of six and 6.1, but as you said, that's because of strong growth in India. India for India we expect seven and a half and six and a half percent growth this last fiscal year and this fiscal year. In the rest of the region, growth is going to be kind of in line with that elsewhere. So around so three and three quarters percent and four and a quarter percent next year. And that means that the rest of the region is not going to make much progress towards advanced economy per capita incomes. Now you ask what are the reasons? It depends a bit on the country, but there are two main challenges or cross-cutting challenges. One is a short-term challenge, just trying to emerge from the troubles of the last two years. Several countries in the region had balance of payments crises or, or debt problems. And while these are being resolved, the, the economic activity has yet to fully recover. The other issue in these countries was that a lot of, in several of them, policies were taken to address balance of payment pressures that interrupted economic activity. So import controls, foreign currency controls, export surrender requirements, heavy handed interventions that yes, they helped uh, ease some of the balance of payments pressures, but now they, it takes economic activity a bit of time, even if they're beginning to be unwound, to really recover. So that's a short term challenge. And then long term, there have been long standing structural challenges. So one of them is low productivity. Labor productivity is on par with that of sub Saharan Africa. It's the, uh, together with Africa, it's the region with the lowest labor productivity. Employment, Martin and Ahmed have already touched on that. May, labor markets are weak. So the South Asia is the region, no, the, Almost all countries in South Asia fall into the bottom, in the lowest quartile of emerging market and developing economies by the number of women who are employed and by the number of people who are employed in non-agriculture. The region is the largest source of immigrants, of migrants around the world. Labor markets are just weak and that's what politicians are struggling with. And then finally, the region is also fairly close to trade. 
It's on average, we show in our report, the trade to GDP ratio is about 30 percentage points of GDP lower than in the average emerging market and developing economy. That means opportunities for competition missed. That's opportunities for markets missed. That's a whole growth opportunity missed there. So these are long-standing challenges, and they continue to constrain growth in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. That sets the stage. And I would now move to Nayab. Uh, you know, to talk about, uh, you know, the, the population growth uh, and which we used always as an uh, engine for output growth. And you've been working a lot on demographic trends. And do you think that there is a slowing down and uh, will it be able to capture the dem demographic dividends? And is there uh, differences in how different part of South Asia is responding to this? So maybe we can uh, kickstart from there, your intervention, Naya, over to you. Thank you, Sajeev. Uh, this idea of demographic dividend, I mean, I, I love it for the fact that it's like a crossover between economics and demography. Uh, economics meet demography and you'll get a demographic dividend, but we have to be very clear that it's just a potential. Uh, it's a window, it's a potential, and you have to reap it by doing the right things. Uh, this idea came out from uh, South Korea. In hindsight, they were analyzing why did South Korea develop uh, so quickly. And they found out that it was aid structure and the investments they have made in human capital. Human capital is the key. I mean, without investing in human capital, which includes education, health, skills, uh, demographic dividend cannot be reaped. And looking at South Asia, uh, we see that uh, countries of uh, South Asia are at uh, different stages of demographic transition. We see India and Bangladesh who had uh, a faster fertility decline. And for them, the proportion uh, of the population in the working ages, it will start to go down after 2030. Then we have Pakistan, uh, which almost has a stagnating uh, fertility decline. For us, the proportion would uh, still be uh, high for the working ages still uh, after 2050. So we have uh, sort of different strategies for different countries, but the key remains human capital, and I would add labor and employment, the job market. If you look at uh, South Asia, you have India, which is growing fast. But if you look at the unemployment rate, especially uh, for the young, the under 25, just the recent uh, report coming out of India, it showed that 42%, if I'm not wrong, uh, of the under 25 population uh, in India is unemployed. Then you have Pakistan, which does not show uh, economic growth. And we even see over 30% unemployment for the graduated youth. People with degrees, I mean, if we think that uh, equipping uh, individuals with education is, is a panacea for everything, we see that even education is not sorting the problem. So it, it's complex strategies. I mean, you have to have right education, relevant education that links to the labor market and not just jobs. I mean, the jobs have to be uh, gainful jobs jobs that that i mean again uh i, I do mo most of my work on pakistan if i see there is a lot of unpaid labor i mean that's not going to bring you a demographic dividend and a very major part of demographic dividend lies in after uh employment in savings in investment and that's how i mean the whole idea of second demographic dividend it is from human capital bringing you more employment opportunities bringing in more income to more savings to more investment and the virtuous cycle of more investment more savings and more investment bringing in more money and more savings so if you look at south asia yes uh some countries are showing more growth some are not but on the whole we are missing on something i mean 
India is like an envy for Pakistan right now. Their economic growth is uh, something that we look up to. But just a report coming out yesterday showed that uh, the inequality in the country is increasing. So you cannot reap demographic dividend if there is no equal access to opportunities. You have to have an aspect of equity and equality in economic growth. I mean, it, it might sound a little dramatic, but unless everyone is a part, I mean, disparities are a natural thing. You, you cannot expect sure, all sure. the population to be equal, but a more equitable uh, policy, a strategy that brings in everyone, which leads to growth, but a growth that caters to everyone's need. Thank you. Thank you, Nayab. I think uh, what came out very clearly is that we are looking at demographic dividends, but the dividend has to also be equitable. I think that's that's a that's a big point. So let's shift gear and I'll go to Subrakant Pandey, uh, Panda. And, uh, you know, sort of we now talking about uh, today, even in the fireside chat, it was coming out that a lot of this is being uh, pushed by public sector growth. But uh, you've been writing about and, of course, leading a private sector um, apex body you talk about how private sector needs to step up and uh, drive growth could you just explain that a bit uh thank you sajid um so you're absolutely right that uh, you know if you look at uh, uh, at uh, growth in india over the last two or three years it has been uh, you know given a, a boost by uh, public sector uh, investment uh, which has been at record levels uh, if you look at the last budget for, uh, I mean, it was at uh, 10 trillion rupees, which is 3.3% of GDP, uh, and the outlay in uh, in the current year's budget uh, uh, is uh, has been hiked further by 11% to 11 uh, trillion rupees. But uh, I think there is a, uh, you know, one needs to understand the context in which uh, this has happened, because if you look at the COVID period, I mean, obviously, that was a, that was a difficult time where, um, uh, I mean, economic activity was uh, was uh, insipid, uh, and uh, I mean, India didn't have the luxury of uh, of uh, helicopter money, and I would say even the wisdom of uh, of uh, not doing so, uh, and the, the way the government approached was to ensure that there was a helping hand uh, extended to those at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, some degree of, uh, of fiscal incentives, but more than anything else, looking at uh, COVID as a you know the COVID crisis as an opportunity. To address it through a sustained reforms, which uh, which would look to convert that opportunity, um, that crisis into an opportunity, uh, and the vehicle to do so was through uh, public sector capex. Uh, and we, of course, all know that when you look at uh, at uh, spending on infrastructure, it is not just the money spent uh, on infrastructure, but the knock on effect, the multiplier effect that it has uh, across various sectors of the economy. Uh, and that is where I think uh, I would really commend uh, the government for the heavy lifting that it did during the covid period and its immediate aftermath which kept the uh, you know which kept the economy chugging along but uh, i mean that is obviously not a long term solution uh, and uh, you know in in various interactions senior government officials including the finance minister and others uh, have been pushing for uh, for private sector investment but what is good to see uh, is that that is now beginning to happen you are seeing more than just green shoots uh, uh, in, in fact, um, the data that is uh, that is out there suggests that um, uh, you know as the uncertainty of uh, COVID has receded, even though we have other gro uh, global crises, etc., which uh, which are a cause of concern. But as in general, as uncertainty has receded and um, India has done uh, well economically, that's when the private sector is stepping up in terms of investments. And in fact, some of the data which has been released recently, which is uh, by the Reserve Bank of India, pertaining to uh, loans which have been sanctioned in the April to December 2023 period, uh, that shows uh, an increase of about 23%, uh, which indicates that certainly private sector is now in that mood to invest and uh, and uh, uh, move things uh, ahead. Um, FICI also regularly carries out a, a manufacturing survey. And uh, what that has shown over the last, uh, you know, six odd quarters is that um, the, you know, the average capacity utilization has steadily increased uh, to a level of about 74, 75%, which means we are in that territory where uh, as surplus capacity starts getting uh, uh, used, there is that incentive for uh, to, to start investing. So I would, you know, I would... Um, uh, I would look at it from the point of view that um, government has done a commendable job in terms of the heavy lifting uh, during COVID. 
and is now sort of elegantly stepping aside and letting the private sector come in and do its bit. Um, that apart, uh, there has, of course, been a lot of focus on reforms, as I mentioned. The biggest of them, of course, was uh, the, uh, the GST uh, being implemented, which, um, uh, you know, which removed internal uh, uh, barriers to trade, creating a very large unified uh, domestic market, um, not to mention a slew of other, um, uh, other reform measures. Um, such as, uh, I mean, aimed at at uh, reducing the uh, the cost of doing business through the national logistics policy. Uh, the ease of doing business has been a, has been a continuous focus uh, by way of um, of decriminalization of minor offences, doing away with um, with um, uh, you know uh, old uh, uh, rules and regulations which are not uh, you know which don't make sense in the in the modern world. So all of this, I would uh, I would think, are uh, have contributed to um, to not just economic uh, growth in India, uh, but also uh, creating sort of the uh, uh, the pathway for uh, private sector to now step up and do its bit, which is what we are now seeing in terms of um, both um, uh, the high levels of GSC uh, collection. What uh, what was about one point four trillion rupees a month on average is now moved up to about 1.6, 1.7 trillion a month. Uh, and you're also, as I said, um, seeing uh, uh, private sector investment uh, start to ramp up, which is reflected in the, the uh, you know, the, the GDP numbers, most recently, of course, 8.4% in the, in the previous quarter. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Subrakant. I, I cannot agree more with to what you're saying, uh, leading Nepal Economic Forum or private sector uh, research uh, analysis think tank and we've been pushing and so in the Nepal 2030 report we talked about how uh, private sector would be the engine for growth you know in case of Nepal seven eight billion dollars required in investments and the domestic capital formation is less so you need international private sector to come in so that that's the way only way we can move ahead and it's great to hear the, the India story and I'll come back to jobs uh, and the, the private sector in the next round. I would move back to uh, Francisca and, uh, you know, in the report, the South Asia Development uh, Update, there's some highlights on policy options. Uh, how do you look at regions employment weaknesses? Uh, there are issues relating to opening up trade, uh, strengthening of legal protection of human uh, women's rights. So and also firm level job creation. So a lot of these things have been brought up at the update. So especially given the fiscal challenges the countries are having, how can uh, institutions like the World Bank play a role in facilitating these uh, policy implementation? Over to you, Francisca. Thank you. The, can you hear me? I'll mute myself. Okay. Uh, the, so in the report, we, we narrow down the problem to the non-agricultural sector. In almost all countries, the non-agricultural employment share of the working age population is in the bottom quartile of other emerging markets and developing economies. So that seems to be the main source of the problem, the non-agricultural sector. Uh, and then we look for a whole range of correlates. What, what, what could be the sources? And we identified three main factors that could be the, 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 the root of the problem in South Asia. So South Asia stands out in its low firm size. Almost all South Asian countries have an average firm size that's well below the average in other emerging markets and developing economies. Small firms don't create many jobs if they don't grow very quickly. And firms in South Asia are small. The second thing where the region stands out, and we discussed that already, is trade. So the trade to GDP ratio is just very, very low. And that tends to be associated with less employment creation in non-agriculture. And finally, education, Doha mentioned it already, Nayab, sorry, Nayab mentioned it already, that, uh, that education, higher education is associated with more employment creation. But of course, Nayab is right, it's not the only thing, uh, many things need to play together. So the policies then need to focus on what seems to be three priorities for the region, across the region, most countries of the region. And uh, you're right that governments have not much room to play, simply because fiscal positions are strained in, in just about every country, almost every country in the region. And a lot of these policies that could help would likely cost money. Yeah, for example, tariff reduction, the region has above average tariffs, yeah, tariff reduction, given out how much the region relies on trade taxation to generate as low revenue ratios, which are low anyways. Yes, that would have fiscal cost. 
or things like uh, another obstacle to firms growing seems to be labor market, land markets, land markets in particular. It costs money to digitize them, to, to create the title registries, et cetera. So here's something where the World Bank can help. We've developed a lot of expertise in making think markets run smoothly with, with sort of the back office functions, like titling or registries or the, the um, getting labor regulations right, or at least up to best practices of what's normal in other emerging markets, developing economies. Size dependent policies tend to penalize any firm that grows above a certain size. Maybe it's time to raise these thresholds in labor regulations, maybe in tax regulations. So that will in the long run cost less of an administrative cost for tax authorities and labor authorities. So not all of these uh, policies need to cost money, but some will. And the World Bank can step in with money, of course, or MDBs <laughs> can step in with money. But maybe more importantly, they can step in with international expertise, like a benchmark. What is the best practice? And that is something where the knowledge function of the, the World Bank and its global footprint, the fact that it's present really everywhere, that is something where the World Bank can really contribute, we hope. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Francisca. This is uh, set the stage. So we have we have we are keeping on putting into three different uh, perspectives. And I, you know, that's a good policy perspective. We discuss about policy formulation, policy implementation, where the World Bank can co come in. So I go back to NIAB to continue the discussion. We are talking about equitable. And we, we went into so when we are talking about equitable, we also talk about women, 50% of uh, the population and uh, we see that in South Asia that is a challenge where we have women uh, in informal uh, work, uh, unpaid work and uh, could you just talk a bit about this and why this is important uh, in terms of uh, increasing labor productivity, accelerating growth, where does this the role of women come in and you've been doing a lot of work around that Nayib so if you would like to share a bit of light on that. Well uh, no country can develop with half its population not being part of it, being treated differently. Uh, the World Bank flyer said that one fourth, I mean, uh, three fourths are not in the labor force in Pakistan. It's even worse. It's it's four fifths not in the labor force. It's just little over 20% uh, that are in the labor force. But for me, even uh, starker is the fact that despite low labor force participation rates, the unemployment rates are still higher for females than for males. So what is it that the economy is doing to discourage female workers? I think uh, I, I would uh, say that, and I mean, the female employment, it's, it's a combination, I mean, along with a high unemployment rates, it's unpaid work, its involvement in informal uh, employment, and most of the women are involved in non-market tasks. I mean, I, uh, at PIDE, we did a calculation uh, monetizing the non-market work that females do in Pakistan. And if you start monetizing that work, it's much higher than male. And, but why is it that the formal uh, labor market does not provide them uh, the opportunity there are barriers and we need to reduce those barriers. Those barriers are in access to education, access to jobs, uh, the discriminatory frameworks in which they have to work, the labor market laws. I mean, Francesca also uh, talked about it. And one thing about firms, I mean, in Pakistan, the size of the firm is a problem, maybe because most of the firms are family businesses. I mean, they work so differently that it's not exactly creating jobs. It's not open uh, to everyone. It's like a family business, small in size, limited job opportunities. So the whole institutional framework in which businesses are being conducted, I think they also contribute uh, to low female employment. And then to top that, uh, there are the gender norms. And I think it's it's something that you find in all South Asian countries, men and women. I mean, they are treated differently across the globe, but 
in South Asia, you see this, uh, this gender characterization much more uh, than in un, uh, other countries. So if the females have to be part uh, in the formal market, in the labor market, of course, the economy is going to be more productive if uh, there, is, there are more workers, but drastic uh, changes need to take place uh, in the mindset and in the way women and female workers are perceived in the society. Thank you. Thank you, Nayab. Uh, it's uh, very interesting. And I think uh, just to bring you the Nepali context here is that we have seen some very interesting statistics coming out of Nepal in terms of women participation in business, in terms of the index of South Asia. Nayab, you are aware of those index. And uh, also, as I was uh, doing some writing uh, last week, it's very interesting to see that in the capital markets, there are out of every five men in the uh, participating in capital market, there are four women participating yeah. like in india that's and one i mean you spend. see you see uh the female labor force participation much higher in nepal than in other countries uh, okay out of the four countries They're, so that's, a, that's a, i mean human lives don't work in isolation there are so many no, factors going together no. yes no definitely uh, then we can continue that discussion but again shifting gears a bit in terms of looking at private sector subrakant in terms of uh one of the key things that we're talking about is that non-agriculture sectors have not been able to create enough jobs. So where does the private sector come in to drive these non-agriculture jobs in the region and how can governments or other institutions support this? So if I were to uh, you know, talk about India, what is uh, very clear is that uh, you know, the agriculture sector accounts for about 17 to 18% of GDP and uh, close to 50% uh, of jobs. And that's uh, simply not uh, tenable. Um, so, I mean, going ahead, that is something that needs to be addressed and it is being addressed. Um, and I think there are two, uh, uh, two answers to this. One is, of course, the services sector, which has done very well uh, in India, which has grown at a rapid clip, which has contributed to growth. Uh, and it will, of course, do its bit. But for a country like India, uh, I think it is important for the manufacturing sector to step up. Now, if you look at the last 15, 20, 30 years, uh, despite uh, you know, the efforts of multiple governments, uh, manufacturing has you know, been in that 15 to 18 percent uh, of GDP range. Uh, and that's simply not, uh, not uh, good enough, uh, which is why I think uh, this government has focused very sharply on, uh, on measures which will uh, take uh, manufacturing up to uh, 25 percent of GDP to begin with and then uh, and, you know, move up further. Uh, and that's of course very important, both from a uh, you know from an economic perspective to be self-reliant to the extent possible, uh, as well as the fact that uh, you know job creation is uh, is going to be influenced strongly by how the manufacturing sector um, uh, responds. Now, in in that context, I mean just to again repeat the points I, I had made earlier that uh, sustained reforms uh, focused on ease of doing business, on reducing the cost of doing business, uh, all of these have. Um, have helped uh, uh, you know, uh, provide a boost to manufacturing. But what has in particular worked out very well is uh, you know, the PLI scheme or the production linked uh, incentive scheme, uh, which uh, is intended to create uh, global uh, manufacturing champions based out of India, where after a, a careful review, 14 sectors were identified to begin with, uh, which are either sensitive uh, or uh, you know, where India is unnecessarily import dependent. I mean, one example of that would be personal electronics. I mean. Uh, one way to look at it is that uh, God has decreed that we need to import some fossil fuel, but uh, there is absolutely no need for us to be, uh, you know, for uh, for uh, personal electronics bill to be as high as it used to be. Uh, and in that context, uh, the the PLI scheme, particularly for uh, for mobile phones and personal electronics, has done exceedingly well uh, with uh, with a, a rapid increase uh, uh, in in output over the last uh, twelve to eighteen uh, uh, sorry eighteen odd months. Um, and this is something that, um, I mean, look, one way to look at it is that the PLI scheme is not a panacea for everything that um, uh, that needs to be uh, done to boost manufacturing in India, but it certainly is a focused effort uh, and a darn sight better approach than uh, uh, than earlier uh, sort of subsidies, which were, um, you know, which, which uh, were uh, misdirected or not uh, efficiently transmitted across. Whereas this is a sort of a limited time scheme, which is intended to provide a boost to certain sectors. So um, some in substance, if you look at it from a, from a private sector perspective, if you look at it from a job creation perspective, uh, I think um, uh, both uh, the services sector needs to, to continue its momentum, which is happening, uh, and manufacturing needs to, to pick up. 
uh, in uh, and and you know rise uh, uh, significantly in order to absorb people moving away from uh, from the agricultural sector and looking for uh, for jobs um that apart i think uh, from a from a general uh, uh, you know uh, uh, perspective as to what all needs to be done um, there was a, uh, I mean, we, we've talked about the demographic dividend. That's, of course, I mean, India is not just the world's most populous nation, but the youngest. Uh, the dependency ratio is very low. Uh, and more importantly, the, in, the, the, the number of uh, people in the working age population is going to be higher than the non-working population for the next uh, two to three decades. So that is, a, that is an unbelievable opportunity that lies uh, before us. But of course, that, uh, that means investment in uh, uh, in education, health, and uh, and skills, as was uh, as was pointed out, uh, and in each of these areas, I think uh, whether it is the new education policy, which is which is more flexible, whether it is the increased outlays for health, uh, or of course the massive uh, skill uh, development mission, which has uh, which is uh, you know which has been the government's focus uh, area, uh, uh, all of these are uh, are uh, important to ensure that uh, that we are uh, you know uh, that we have a population which is. Um, uh, which is employable and uh, and is uh, adequately trained to uh, to take up jobs for uh, in in the modern area in an area in an era where we have uh, you know artificial intelligence machine learning etc which certainly will put pressure on the low end uh, low skill repetitive jobs and that is where of course um, you know yeah. skilling and reskilling is something which is important Thank you. Uh, thank you, Subrakant. Uh, so we come to the final round and just looking at the clock, we have very few minutes left. So one issue that the South Asia Development Update talk highlights is the success of firms in climate adaptation. So I'm going to give 60 seconds each to each of the three speakers. I would want Francisca to talk about a bit of the public sector support and what governments can do. Uh, then I will continuing the, uh, the equitable distribution part of it I'll come to Nayab to talk about how we can make this adaptable, and then I would want to uh, get a private sector view from Subrakan. So we'll go Francisca, Nayab, and Subrakan, 60 seconds each. Your final comments on climate adaptation. Thank you, Sudeep. Yeah, so there's three things that governments can do. First is to provide public goods and services, because this is really, if, without that, households and farmers struggle to adapt to climate change. It really needs a classic, old-fashioned public goods and services, just development. Second, firms really adapt to climate change through technology. So anything that can help firms access finance, adapt, adopt new technologies, whether it's information or access to finance, will help. And the third is actually picking up what, on what Suprakan said. It's true, the demographic trends are a golden opportunity for the region, not just for growth, but also for climate adaptation, if the jobs can be created that allow these households and farmers that are being hit by climate shocks, that allow them to move into a non-agricultural job. And that requires all the policies that come with it, including the education policies that Nayab mentioned. Thank you, Francisca. Over to you, Nayab. Your 60 My 60 seconds. seconds. I mean, climate crisis is, is very unfair. It's the poor that suffer the most. So adding to the three things that uh, Frazinska said, I'll add three to it. Uh, number one, climate resilient infrastructure. I mean, uh, I remember a Japanese making a statement that it's not the earthquake, but bad construction that kills people. We have to get the infrastructure right. It does not have to be expensive, but it has to be smart that, that caters to the shocks that every area uh, can be subjected to. Then we need, then the governments, especially the governments and any organization that's investing on it on early warning systems. The people need to know that, it, I mean, you can't predict it in every case, but a lot of uh, disasters can be predicted. Early warning system and picking on what Ahmed and Martin said uh, in the start, there needs to be a global cooperation. Uh, the poor suffer, the rich enjoy their life, I mean, this this needs to change. They have to mend their ways. There has to be a global cooperation so that climate is not a source of, of disaster for anyone. Thank you. Shubhrakant, your 60 seconds, private sector, climate adaptation. What can we do? Uh, before that, let me just make a quick point, which is that uh, if I'm not mistaken, India is, uh, I think, the only large economy, certainly the only one in the G20, which has stuck to its uh, commitments uh, made at COP26 in terms of renewal, uh, renewable energy, uh, transition. 
And uh, there is a great degree of focus driven by the prime minister's personal conviction uh, about uh, about the need to uh, you know to to address uh, climate change in a very serious manner. So whether it is the you know the national hydrogen mission or uh, or a general approach towards uh, decarbonization, I think that is uh, that is something which which has the attention of the highest levels of government. Now, for for a private sector perspective, I'd actually go back to a point which uh, Ahmed made in his uh, in his uh, remarks, which is that um, institutional capacity is actually limited to to government and to large uh, firms. So, in a study that uh, that Fiki did uh, last year uh, about uh, you know awareness of and preparedness for sustainability, uh, we were very pleasantly surprised uh, amongst uh, MSMEs. I should I should add, we were very pleasantly surprised to see the degree of awareness that uh, that is there. Uh, driven to a large extent by, you know, by supply chains needing to be compliant. So larger companies, um, uh, you know, seeing uh, and handholding their uh, their uh, supply chains to to uh, to ensure a journey towards sustainability. But I think the challenge uh, challenge before us and what I would like to see uh, is how do we, you know, the, the big boys know what needs to be done. If they don't, they know which consultants to go to and can afford them and 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 implement ideas. I think the challenge before us. Um, in as much as the private sector is concerned, is how to see that uh, the you know the small and medium enterprises uh, have uh, adequate handholding because there is that awareness, there is that uh, desire to change, but the capability and the you know and the uh, and the financial uh, cap uh, uh, ability to go through with these um, you know with with what needs to be done is somewhat constrained. So I think that is going to be key for us to. Uh, to see that uh, uh, you know that the entire industrial ecosystem as a whole sort of makes that uh, journey towards uh, uh, sustainable growth. Thank you, thank you, Subrakant. This has a been a wonderful panel, and I think just to continue, we need to continue these conversations. In February in Nepal, we hosted the first Himalaya Future Forum, and as Ahmed was saying, everybody is fated into twine. So private sector, you know, the government, um, the development partners, MDDs and academic institutions, think tanks, we all need to come together to really keep these conversations going. Thank you very much, panelists, for amazing discussions. And there was a lot of insights. Uh, and do join the conversations through South Asia Development and read the report that has been launched today at worldbank.org slash South Asia Development. Thank you, panelists, organizers, and especially people joining the sessions from different parts of the world. Have a good day, good afternoon, good evening depending on where you are. This is your host, Sujeev Shakya, signing off. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sujeev. Thank you, everyone.